Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Next week, a special event honoring the legacy of author, philosopher, teacher William Gass will be held at Washington University, his academic home for some 30 years. He was instrumental in establishing the university's modern literature collection there. It's a collection that includes manuscript materials from scores of authors. Gass also founded and directed the International Writers Center at Washington University. The April 6th event is being held on the four-month anniversary of William Gass's death. He was a giant in his field. His writing was celebrated internationally. And joining me in studio is Joel Miner, curator of the Modern Literature Collection at Washington University. Joel, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. We, When uh, William Gass died uh, in December, we did a program uh, remarking on his success and his accomplishments. Uh, what do you see as his legacy? Well, um, as the curator of the Modern Literature Collection, I'm very focused on his literary legacy um, in general, but also um, his legacy with Washington University, um, the writers there, um, and the founding of the Modern Literature Collection in 1964. He was uh, one of the first writers that Mona Van Dyne and Stanley Elkin and others asked to uh, donate uh, Mm -hmm. his papers to. And this was even before his first novel, uh, uh, Omen Setter's Luck, was mm-hmm. published in 1966. And so he wrote back a very uh, amusing letter about that, kind of self-deprecating as, as he was often um, about, you know, he didn't have much to donate. He, he was very flattered, but um, eventually he did in the 1960s. And ever since then... He's been donating to the collection uh, his papers, which is um, very generous. Um, and also, he's he's been very uh, active with the library and with the Modern Literature Collection on exhibits, on talks, and getting the papers of William Gaddis, his good friend and fellow uh, postmodernist. <clears throat> when you talk right. about getting the papers, what what are we really talking about? Are, are, are they notes or are they uh, essays? Or what what exactly are they? They can be notes, essays, uh, correspondence mm-hmm. often. A lot of drafts of the writer's work um, is very important in, in, in a writer's archive. It can also include personal artifacts, um, in, including um, uh, awards that they win mm-hmm. or uh, uh, memorabilia from their childhood, um, photo albums, things like that. So mm-hmm. anything that really gives a scholar or a fan insight into the writer's creative process and also their life in general, their professional career, is very important to understanding them. So these uh, these uh, papers are available to anyone who cares to uh, to look at them? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. We we are open uh, to <clears throat> everyone and anyone who's interested and is, is willing to fill out our patron form. And we'll be happy to bring uh, anything that we have in the collection up to look at. Mm. We often host classes. Um, you would, as you would imagine, creative writing classes um, come in to look at uh, papers of, of Gas and other writers, and uh, to to be inspired and and to uh, see that process of, of of creating these you know masterworks of fiction or, or poetry. In in Gas's case, there are amazing drafts of his early books, especially when he was writing on a typewriter. You can see him rewriting. Typewriter, what's that? I know, right? Uh, you can see him writing the same sentence or paragraph over and over on mm-hmm. the same page. He, you, can, you can tell he's working to get it right. And, and he's famous for being a master pro stylist. And so a, a novice or a, a new writer can see, well, look, this master really had to work at it mm-hmm. to get it just, you know, the, the, the rhythm and, 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 and the structure just right. And so uh, that's fascinating. And, and you don't see that as much in current writers' manuscripts that, who are working on computers because, as we all do, we just type over it, right? We just erase it uh, it's, it's, often. It's a very simple process. Uh, I, I've heard it said that, uh, that gas was difficult for a lot of people to understand. Would you agree with that? I, not really. Oh, he's over the head of some readers? I think he has that reputation, and, and I don't think it's really warranted. I, I hadn't read him before I started work here, and I, I, which was about six years ago, and, and I had that 
that feeling about him that he's very uh, over my, over the top, over my head. Um, but I, I found his work very approachable. Uh, Middle C, w- I think, is a a very engrossing, <laughs> approachable book. Um, if if you if you go into it knowing it's not going to be a strictly linear narrative from start to finish, you're you're going to be able to follow it and really appreciate his uh, his ability to uh, to work the language in a unique way in 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 this character's perspective and so much of his work is from one character's perspective uh he coined the term metafiction which uh, often involves the author or the narrator as part of the story it's a very self-conscious style uh, that he and others of, of his generation um really made popular in the 1960s and 70s and and beyond um but but it's a uh, as long as you're okay with that style, uh, I think it's very approachable. And uh, his he also was a very prolific essayist. Mm-hmm. And so I think not just about literature but a culture and, and arts in general. And one can learn a lot from, from those essays, uh, how to approach literature and art. If, if someone wanted to take on William Gass and, yeah. and begin and begin the journey through mm-hmm. his work, where where would you recommend that they start? I would recommend Middle C. I, I think I think it really is an approachable novel. Uh, people often start with uh, "In the Heart of the Heart of the Country," which are short stories from the 1960s, and so being shorter, they maybe feel a little more digestible. Um, and it also they also give the reader a really good sense of his style. Most people would avoid the tunnel first because it's so big, and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I would probably agree with that. That wouldn't be the first place to start. On being blue is another popular one to start with. It's it's a uh, I think Robert Coover referred to it as as an essay masquerading as a as a uh, uh, um, or it, it it's fiction masquerading as as an essay and and he did the similar thing with um Willie Masters Lonesome Wife it's presented as 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 fiction but it's it's also an essay a meditation on the act of writing um and so that's what I find fascinating about him as well there's a lot of crossover between uh fiction and nonfiction and uh, I think you can get that with this metafiction concept of of the writer the author the the narrator being a part of of the story for the reader, he lived to be ninety three. I believe uh-huh. he was when he died, um, but he was a very prolific guy. He had a lot of years, but he was very prolific. Very prolific, uh, pretty pretty remarkable. Yeah. Middle C was written published uh, in twenty thirteen, and so he was almost ninety years old. And that's another remarkable thing about it. it was, I believe he was very much at the top of his game right up until the end. <laughs> What about his international reputation? I mean, uh-huh. obviously, he's very prolific and very talented, but he did have a, a very established reputation abroad. Very much. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the International Writers <laughs> Center, which he started at Washington University and ran that with Lauren Cuoco for 10 years. And that has uh, – he's very popular in Europe especially. His, his work is very uh, widely uh, translated. We have all those translations at the library. Um, <laughs> But he did work with international writers uh, very regularly uh, through the International Writers Center and beyond. Uh, he really believed in um, you know breaking down boundaries and thinking outside of one's um, one's own country in this case. And uh, I think we are trying to maintain that legacy uh, with collaborating with uh, the Comparative Literature Department on regular symposiums, uh, a gas symposium on international writing. We did one uh, last year or the year before, and we're going to do one uh, next spring, another one we're planning. So we want to keep that legacy alive. With how, how is the International Center structured? How is that set up? The International Writers yeah, Center? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. What do you mean set up? Um, what, is it, what does it uh, consist of? I mean, how does it, uh, how does it present? Well, it's it's no longer it, it after gas left in two thousand one. It became the Center for Humanities, which oh. became a different uh, a different focus uh, than the International Writers Center. Um, 
But basically, they did programming around uh, around St. Louis. They, uh, as well as Washington University, they brought in regular speakers. They did um, the writer in politics, the writer in religion symposiums, the dual muse, which was about writers who are also artists and vice versa. So they did uh, symposiums and conferences as well as readings, and um, they were involved with uh, putting uh, poetry on you know trains and buses and uh, just. Get, promoting literature, especially mm-hmm. uh, locally, as well, and, and exposing the St. Louis community to mm-hmm. those international writers. Why did he stay in St. Louis? Well, I, that, that's a great <laughs> question. Uh, I, I mean, I think I think he was he was very happy here with uh, working at Washington University. I mean, what I've read, I you know, I can't really speak for him. Of course, uh, is uh, he he didn't really fit in with, you know, the the New York literati necessarily. And and uh, he was a Midwesterner, and, you know, yeah. all his life. Uh, so I think uh, same with Elkin and, and some others who, who you know, WashU has a very uh, strong reputation in literature and these literary people, Howard Nemiroff um, and, and others who came to St. Louis and really <clears> – <throat> decided to stay. They, they loved it. You know, Tennessee Williams hated St. Louis. Yeah, yeah. And I, I understand that William Gass really, really didn't like New York City. Right. I yeah. mean, it probably was, it was a similar kind of feeling. Yeah. I have a question here that uh, asks, what goes into housing a complete collection? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we, of course, have a, a vault in the library, and we're actually getting a, a second vault for special collections there. So uh, temperature controlled, humid, you know, humidity controlled. Yeah is important for long-term storage and then archival boxes and folders and things like that. Uh, we want to try to keep everything uh, safe from environmental harm uh, for as long as possible. Um, and then, you know, we have a nice reading room for people to to uh, access the materials in a monitored environment. Well, you've got to be very careful when people access these things yes. and hold them in their hands. Yes. That's taking them away from their... Uh, protection, if you will. Yeah, and similar to what mm-hmm. you asked about about gas being seeming inaccessible to readers, we we want people to feel like special collections uh, are accessible to them. And so, while we do have some rules about, you know, we don't want pens and food and drink around them, we want people to come in and feel like they can pick things up and turn the pages and and use them and and touch them because that's what they're there for. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the event on April 6th. Right. What, what uh, all is involved in that? So, yeah, we, we have uh, – we're starting off in the special collections in the library. We're going to have uh, a set of speakers, uh, including Catherine Davis, uh, Martin Riker, Mark Rollins. Um, and uh, they're going to talk about working with gas, being inspired by gas uh, in the philosophy department. Uh, and, and, as well as at um, Dalkey Archive Press and as, as a writer, uh, his influence on them. And then we're going to have a manuscript viewing after that in the special collections. So some of these things I've been talking about, people can, can see mm-hmm. it for themselves. And then we're going to head over to Holmes Lounge, uh, which is right next door on campus, and we'll have another slate of speakers there, including Lauren Cuoco, who worked with Gas at the International Writers' Center, Michael Eastman, a local photographer who has collaborated with Gas, and uh, Matthias Goritz, who is a uh, uh, the Gas Fellow in Comparative Literature at WashU, and then two uh, esteemed novelists, Garth Riss Kahlberg, an alum of WashU, and uh, Joy Williams, longtime friend and colleague of his, whose papers we just got. Oh. Uh, so we're excited to to uh, promote that as well, and and Chancellor Wrighton will be speaking too. This is really testimony to the uh, admiration they have for mm-hmm. William Gass because these people are not all in town. They're coming in. That's they? right. Yeah. yeah, and they were they were quick mm-hmm. to say yes when we asked. Uh, mm-hmm. We thought of them, and and uh, we we're very grateful that they they're giving their time to do this. Uh, there will be a reception after th- after the speaking, and uh, Catherine Gass, uh, Bill's daughter, is a uh, is a professor of photography in Chicago and. She has put together a uh, photograph slideshow of Bill, um, which will run as well. I, I have a note here, and perhaps you can address this, that, the, that uh, he's not finished publishing yet, that the uh, William Gass Reader, yes. uh, including essays, stories, et cetera, is yet to be uh, soon to come out. 
Yeah, I think that's June, and and I just received a uh, uh, uncorrected proof of it from Knopf. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty it's pretty thick, but it's a great overview. Well, really well structured, uh, covering his <clears throat> his fiction and his his nonfiction, his essays about other writers and artists, his essays on writing and fiction, and uh, it, I think it's going to be pretty special. That's the wonderful thing about writers and musicians, if you will, that they may be gone, but their work, their work lives on forever, yes. lives on forever. Yes. Well, thanks very much for telling us about this. Uh, this is open to the public on the 6th. Yep. We'll have information on our website uh, with regard to what's going on. Excellent. Joe Miner, thank you so much for being with us and re- reminding us of the legacy of William Gass. Thank you, Don. It's been a pleasure. Archived versions of past St. Louis on the Air programs are available for download or podcast at stlpublicradio.org slash stlonair. St. Louis on the Air is produced by Alex Hoyer, Evie Hemphill, and Lara Hamden, with production assistance from Aaron Dorr and John Larson. The executive producer is Mary Edwards. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening. I'm Don Marsh. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.